Have you ever minimized a real problem in your life? Like you see something, it's a very big deal, but you kind of minimize it because it helps you feel better about the situation. When I was like 16 or 17 years old, um, I was driving my parents' car, a little black Honda Accord that my dad had kind of tricked out and made look really nice for my mom. And uh, I was going over to my girlfriend at the time, her house in downtown Roseburg. And right behind her house was a gravel lot and there was a clear sign, no parking. And nobody was ever back there and uh, there was never cars there. I never saw anybody monitoring it. And I was tired of parking two streets away at the nearest parking lot downtown because everybody kind of parks alongside the road. And so this one night I'm going over there for dinner. I decide, you know what? I'm just going to park in this no parking zone. It's not going to be a big deal. No one monitors it. It's not, no problem. So I parked there. It's right behind her house. And I go up into her house, have dinner, and I come back to find that somebody takes the no parking sign very seriously. My tires were not just deflated, but it looked as though somebody took a knife, stabbed in and slashed on my tires and cut them around the rim on all four tires. Now, this is a very serious problem. I'm looking at a car that is not drivable. But in my mind at the moment, I I thought, well, I mean, there's not air in the tires, but there's still rubber around the wheels and the wheels are round. And all I have to do is get to the other side of town where I live in North Roseburg. And so I'm just going to make, make for it. And I get in the car and I instantly realize this is going to be a bumpy ride, right? Everything's grinding. It's making awful sounds. Um, and so I, I, re- I was wise enough to know, don't take the freeway or I'll just be a flying ball of sparks and a, and a fire hazard down the, down the I-5. And so I took some back roads uh, through town to, to get home. And about a third of the way home, I'm driving and I'm just noting the thud, the thud, the thud, rubber flying out the sides of my cars and the wheel wells. And eventually sparks started shooting out of the back of my car <laughs> because I took a very serious situation and minimize it. It'll probably be okay. I don't, I don't want to bother dad with this. My dad, by the way, worked at Les Schwab Tires. Still does to this day. <laughs> I was raised by a mechanic and I didn't know that I shouldn't be driving this car with four, with four flats. But I minimized a very serious problem. Today, we're going to continue our series, Lavish. And we're going to look at the gift of righteousness. We're going to marvel at the righteousness that is ours in Christ. But before we get there, we're going to look at a very serious problem. That is our unrighteousness. Because in order to see the beauty of the righteousness that we receive in Christ, we have to know the depths of our depravity. And just like I minimized the plight of my car when four flat tires should not have been driven, I believe often Christians minimize their spiritual state apart from Christ. Though you may not be a flying ball of sparks that go down the road, that there's a real problem that the church has often minimized our spiritual state apart from Christ, that we are in fact, apart from Christ, under sin and unrighteous. There was a study done by George Barna uh, at a cultural research center in Arizona, and he pulled 2,000 evangelical Christians. These are people who go to church. They say they believe the Bible, and in their own words, they would say they have a biblical worldview. And in the survey, they had to approve or reject certain theological statements. One of the statements was, people are not basically good. We are, in fact, sinners. And 75% of evangelicals rejected that doctrine. And as you look at specific denominations within evangelicalism, the numbers only go up. It doesn't get any better. And so the church has minimized our real need for righteousness. The fact that we are sinners and we need righteousness before God. And so today we're going to weigh into the gift of righteousness, the lavish gift of righteousness that God gives to us. But in order to see that for the beautiful thing that it is, we must first examine the depths of our own unrighteousness and sin. And to do that, we're going to be in Romans chapter three. 
Romans, if you've never read it before, it, the first eight-ish chapters is just a gospel argument. I mean, it's just so beautiful expounding on the gospel and the implications of the gospel. Paul the apostle was a guy who radically experienced the gospel in his life, flipped his life upside down. And now he's writing to the Romans and, and he begins uh, just before where we're going to be in, in chapter three, we're going to start in verse nine. Just before that, he's talking about the difference between Jews and Gentiles or Jews and Greeks. Because in this day, Jewish people believed they could attain righteousness before God by obeying the commands of the law, the Levitical law, some 613 commands. They believe they could attain righteousness by obeying the law and offering sacrifices. And Paul says, that's not how righteousness is attained. So we're going to jump into Romans 3, starting in verse 9. If you were having a good day before this moment, Paul the apostle is about to ruin it with nine verses, okay? Buckle up. All right, Romans 3, 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? He says we because Paul was a Jew. No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. He, when he says Jews and Greeks, he's trying to encapsulate humanity. To the Jewish mind, it would be impossible for a Greek to be saved. They are pagans, they are dogs. And, and so the, it, it, the idea that a Greek could be saved would be anybody can be saved, or they can be saved. And in this moment here, he's talking about that the Jews are under sin as well. That just because they have the law and, and the temple and the sacrifices does not mean that they're righteous in the sight of God. And he's going to expound on this argument for the next uh, chunk of scripture we're going to go through. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Now that's a really weighty phrase there. Under sin. It is your oppressor. If you're in Christ, can you remember this season of your life where you were under sin? It was your slave. You were a slave to it. It was your taskmaster. You were under the thumb of the oppressor sin and you obeyed that master. He's saying this is the universal human plight. We come into this world, not in Christ, but under sin. And then he goes on and he's going to expound for several verses using some Old Testament references that kind of expound on what does it look like to live a life that is under sin and marked by unrighteousness. He says, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. The first thing I want us to see as we look at the gift of righteousness is to examine the reality that none of us are righteous. It's the first point on your outline. No one is righteous. And here's, here's the important uh, distinction. What Paul's talking about here in these verses is life apart from Christ. In and of ourselves, we do not possess righteousness. We are not basically good people. We are, in fact, sinners. Although 75% of those 2,000 polled said, no, we're basically good people, thereby minimizing the need for righteousness. Paul the apostle says here, no, we have a real problem. It's a big deal. None is righteous. Look at it again. And we define uh, righteousness as right standing before God in Christ. That's why we don't have righteousness of our own. Because where does it come from? Right standing before God in Christ. We don't have righteousness of our own. It's only in Christ that we're given Righteousness. So when we talk about righteousness today or justification in this passage, both words have the same word grouping behind them. They're, they're almost interchangeable in this passage, righteousness and justification. When we talk about that, we're talking about right standing before God in Christ. So let's look at the passage again. Verse 10, none is righteous. Now, Paul here is referencing some Old Testament passages in the Psalms. In fact, he's referencing five Psalms and, and one passage from Isaiah. And here it says, none is righteous. And, and the psalmist who wrote this was David. And he's talking about the enemies of God. He's saying, God, none of your enemies are righteous. And I love how David anticipates the, the objection when someone says, none, none is righteous. 
immediately, don't you just kind of think, well, what about this guy? What about that person? No, this person's pretty good. They give to charity. They love the homeless. And he anticipates that there's going to be a problem in our minds with none is righteous. And he clarifies, nope, not one. Not one of us is righteous. That is, has right standing before God apart from Christ. No one understands. No one seeks for God. That's another one that stands out. What do you mean no one seeks for God? Right? Like you probably know people in your life who aren't quite a Christian yet. They haven't, they haven't decided to repent of their uh, sin and place their faith in Jesus, but they're kind of kicking the tires and pursuing what is this Jesus thing? And what I think he's saying here is people seek the benefits of God, but they don't seek God himself. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. That word there, again, it's a weighty idea uh, to a culture that was agrarian where your crop is life or death. And this word worthless has the weight behind it of a, uh, of a farmer that goes out amongst this crop that he's poured time and effort and resources into to find it utterly rotten, worthless, of no value. No one does good. Again, you might think, wait, what? there's people who do good in the world. Surely there has to be people. Who, there's people who give to charity. But again, the heart's motivation often, if they're apart from Christ, no one does good. It, the motivation is often very selfish. And so he says, no one does good. And he, he anticipates that we're going to argue with that. And again, he says, no, not even one. Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. Now he's going to go into some very poetic language here. And, and, and I love it because it's like Paul doesn't want us to just know that we are unrighteous. He wants us to feel that apart from Christ, we're unrighteous. And here's the catch. Not so that we would feel shame. No, shame leads to condemnation, not transformation. He wants us to feel the reality of our depravity, our unrighteousness and our sin that we might flee to the cross. And so he's going to use very poetic language here. Their throat is an open grave. That's stark, vivid imagery. He says, their throat is an open grave. It's kind of a, a reference. If you were a Jewish person hearing this, well, dead bodies and open graves can make me unclean if I'm Jewish. I'd have to go through the rituals of becoming clean again. And so what he's saying here is your throat, what comes out of you, your language brings uncleanness, death, decay. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. An asp is a, a serpent, a, likely a cobra or some sort of viper. And, and this culture would have known when you get bit by these, it does not go well for you. There's death and destruction that comes as a result of it. Decay comes. This is like a spiritual x-ray of humanity. And it begins at the head. He says, our mouth, our tongue, our throat brings death, decay, uncleanness. Here's what he's trying to say. Our unrighteousness has affected the way we communicate in the world. It's affected our words. And he clarifies it further. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. So it isn't just some, some uh, intellectual exercise that we're unrighteous. It shows up in our language, but that's not the only place it shows up. Verse 15, their feet are swift to shed blood. Notice he began up here with the mouth, the tongue, the throat. And now he goes all the way down to the feet. This idea that righteous, unrighteousness impacts the totality of a human being. And he says their feet are swift to shed blood. As I was talking to my wife, she's like, I'm, I'm not like wanting to run around and kill people. Like, what does this mean? And I remembered the words of Jesus, where Jesus says, if you hate somebody, it's like committing murder in your heart. Jesus brings this idea to a whole deeper level. And I was reading a commentary on this verse in particular that said, if consequences for sin were removed, this is what humanity would look like. 
This is what unrestrained unrighteousness truly looks like. But we, we have consequences. We have God's common grace restraining evil. We have uh, prison systems and policing to, to restrain this. But the commentator makes the argument, this is what humanity would look like apart from God's common grace restraining evil. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. And so he unpacks all of this unrighteous fruit, right? Cursing and bitterness, deceit, venomous talk, blood shedding feet. And then he gives the diagnosis of the real true problem. He says, here's all the fruit of their life. And here's the belief that fuels all that. There is no fear of God before their eyes. If you didn't catch it, Paul just did fruit to root with us. That tool that we've been talking about over the last year, where you examine the fruit of your life, And then you get down to what belief is fueling whatever you're experiencing, whether that's anxiety or, or in this case, cursing and bitterness and deception. Ultimately, he says, what's fueling all that rotten fruit is there's no fear of God before their eyes that humanity apart from Christ has no reverence, awe, honor, glorification of, or, or fear of God. That's the diagnosis. And I don't expound on this ad nauseum so that we can feel shame. But Paul goes into the depths of depravity that when he talks about a righteousness, it will be all the more beautiful. So as we look at the spiritual x-ray of humanity. You know, it's really easy to kind of look around the room and say, yep, that person, or, or, or to think about our sphere of influence and say, yeah, that person's full of cursing and bitterness. But here's what I want us to wrestle with. What about in our own hearts? How do you think about yourself? Do you know that apart from Christ, this is the spiritual x-ray. This is the, the spiritual diagnosis of humanity apart from Christ. Are you aware of that? Or have you minimized your unrighteousness? Have you minimized your sin? Much like that survey that says, I'm basically a good person. I don't really need righteousness. I'm not a sinner. The gospel of God is not for people who don't need saving. It's for the unrighteous. When we say we have self-righteousness, we disqualify ourselves from the gospel because the gospel is to save sinners. And so have you minimized your sin? Sometimes we minimize our sin by saying, yeah, I've done a couple bad things, but look at all the good I've done. And so the good kind of outweighs the bad and I'll be okay. That's one way we, we justify sin. Another way we justify sin is comparison, right? We look at the lives of others and, well, at least I'm not like that guy. That one's a piece of work over there. And really when I, when I do that, What I've found is I'm I'm comparing the best of myself to the worst of others. And the problem with both of those, uh, with, with, with that one in particular, is you were never placed in the judge seat. Jesus goes there. And when we compare, that's not even the standard. You see, the standard isn't other people. The standard is righteousness. Standard is perfection. And we are, apart from Christ, we are unrighteous. This is universal human truth. So have you minimized that in your own life? I have a tendency to at times. Just this last week, I came home. My daughters were in an argument. And um, I could see the pathway forward for the argument. And they came to me for consultation. And every word I was saying was the truth. It was what needed to be heard. However, how I was saying it was sin. I was yelling at them. And here's what was going on in my mind at the time. I know I'm yelling and I know that's sin, but I'm, at least I'm telling them what they need to hear. Is that not insanity? I know I'm yelling. I know I'm sinning, but I'm going to minimize the fact that I'm sinning because it's the right information they need to hear. Forget that they're not going to hear anything I'm saying because my voice is loud and I'm being angry. I minimized my sin. 
Sin is not small. If we make sin small, we make grace cheap. And grace was not cheap. It was costly. The cross is the definitive statement about how costly our unrighteousness is. So have you minimized sin? Are there, are there things that you're walking in that you think, man, that's not big of a deal. God says he wants people of integrity and honesty, but a white lie won't matter as long as it benefits me. God says, run from sexual passions and sexual immorality. But going to those websites when no one's around won't matter. Like, have you minimized? We are all unrighteous apart from Christ. And when we minimize our sin, we make grace cheap. And it was not cheap because the most valuable treasure in the world, Jesus Christ himself, died in your place. There's a really powerful quote by John Calvin. We will never know the righteousness of Christ until we first know we have none of our own. John Calvin was a theologian and an author. And, and, and he wrote this, this idea that we won't understand the righteousness of Christ until we first see that we don't have any of our own. And so that's why we dig into these verses in Romans chapter three, not that we would feel shame, but that we would flee to the cross for the remedy for the cure, for the antidote to our unrighteousness. Paul continues on. Now we know whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Again, he's encapsulating, he's tripling down on this idea. This is a universal human problem. The whole world is accountable to God. And in fact, we've been found to be unrighteous. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. This would have been a radical idea to the religious Jewish mind of the day. No works of the law can save you, can make you righteous before God. Because again, righteousness is right standing before God in Christ, not by working things out through the law. It's a free gift of Christ. It's not that you can do enough of the Levitical law to attain a standard of righteousness before God. That's not possible. And so he says, look, the law brings knowledge of sin. It's supposed to be like a mirror. Just like in the morning when I get up and I look in the mirror and the mirror doesn't add or subtract. It just shows me what's there. Sometimes that's scary, right? The law is like a mirror to our soul, revealing what's there, revealing the sin and revealing our deep need for a savior. And here's the amazing part, you guys. Yes, we were found to be unrighteous. And yes, God is holy. And you know what that holy, righteous, just Yahweh could have done? He could have said, you're unrighteous, you deserve to be condemned. And he could have wiped us out and sent us to hell. But in his love for us, he chose another way. Look at this. But now, this is such a huge thing, this but now. It's saying, look, you've been found to be guilty of unrighteousness. The law could not save you, but God is doing something different. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it. So apart from the law, meaning you couldn't earn your salvation by doing the right works. So apart from the law, God made another way, although the law and prophets bear witness to it. The law reveals our need for a savior and the prophets spoke of who he would, who he would be. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. He says, look, you've been found guilty. The law could not save you, but God did something else about it. That holy, righteous, just Yahweh came down into our unrighteous mess to redeem us, not condemn us. I really, really, really want us to leave here enamored with God because he offers and extends us righteousness. The second point on our outline is the gift of his righteousness. Let's look at it again. But now the righteousness of God has been made manifest apart from the law. Although the law and prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. 
God took a wretched, unrighteous man like me and instead of condemning me, which he could have justly done, said, no, I'm going to make you righteous in my sight. And it was very costly, so costly that he sent his only son to die in my place, to die in your place. And it is through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe that we are gifted righteousness. And he says, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Again, he, he, he's encapsulating. He's like quadrupling down. This is a universal human problem. All have sinned. And then he tells us what the standard is. You see, the standard was never goodness. I'm basically good. That's what the survey says, right? I'm basically good. I don't need a, a, a savior because I'm not a sinner. I'm basically good. But the standard was never goodness. The standard is glory, glorious perfection. We've sinned and thereby fallen short of the glory of God. But look at verse 24, and are justified by his grace as a gift. That word gift is attached to that justification. And again, justification and righteousness in this passage are used kind of interchangeably. Same word grouping in the original language behind them. So when he says, you've been justified by his grace, you've been made righteous. Listen to me. If you're in Christ, you are righteous. I I taught a sermon very similar to this, uh, a a related subject a couple months ago. uh, And I said, you are holy. And I had people coming up to me afterwards saying, I'm not holy. You don't know what I've done. I'm not holy. You don't know what's in my history. Or the other alternative was they're not holy. Have you seen what they've done? How could you tell all the Christians that they're holy? It's because our righteousness and our holiness is not dependent upon our performance. It is a gift. It's a gift that's given to you and I in Christ. It's not dependent on our performance. It's dependent on Jesus's finished work. That Yahweh, Jesus, he came down and he lived a perfectly righteous life. Does that not blow your mind? Jesus was holiness incarnate. Righteousness incarnate. He lived every day of his life, never giving into temptation, never sinning, never falling short of the glory of God. Always living in perfect communion with the Father and walking in step with the Spirit. And and he lived a righteous life and yet he was still condemned to death on a cross. And on the cross, Jesus took our sin upon himself. The righteous died for the unrighteous. Righteous God died for, for unrighteous, sinful, wretched humanity. And on the cross, the cup of God's wrath was poured out on Jesus. And he drank every last drop which means there's no more for you and I. There's no more wrath. And, and he, he, he didn't stay dead. He, three days later, he rose again. And it's when a sinner, an unrighteous person, a wretch, believes those truths about Jesus, repents of their sin and believes in the gospel, the finished work of Jesus that you are now identified as righteous before God. It is not dependent on your performance. We often look at our life kind of like this, right? Our life is messed up and all crinkled. We got lots of problems and maybe some of us are real. We've got real issues, right? And we're all messed up like this. And we look at our life and man, I've got lots of issues. And we define ourselves by our wrinkles and the holes and the gaps in our lives and the sin that we've walked in. But when you came to Jesus, this is what happened. Before God, you're no longer identified as that wrinkled up piece of paper. He sees you as Christ. He sees you clothed in Jesus's righteousness. That righteousness that he lived perfectly on this earth. 
It's now credited to our account. And in Christ, I am no longer defined by my performances, my behavior. I'm defined by Jesus's accomplishment. How would your life look different if you truly believed this? Like in the day to day of your life, you walked around knowing I'm righteous. I think some people hear that and they think, well, I couldn't do that because I would be nose turned up and holier than thou. The righteousness that God extends us is not our own righteousness. It's the righteousness of God. It's not a slightly improved version of us. It's his righteousness credited to our account. We didn't earn it. So there's no reason to walk around like a holier than thou. But what would it look like if you and I walked around believing every single day we're righteous children of God? That before God, we stand in Christ and therefore we rightly stand before him. Well, how would that impact your life? How would that impact your view of yourself? Listen, you are righteous on your best days and on your worst days in Christ. Nothing can take that from you. But maybe you're here today and you're kind of kicking the tires of who's this Jesus guy and you're checking out church. I implore you. Paul gave those first nine verses, verses nine to 18, not to make you feel shame, but to have you look in the mirror and say, look, there's a real problem called sin and unrighteousness. It is a master over you and you can be set free. And he expounds upon that, that you might flee to the cross. And so I implore you, if you're not a follower of Jesus, Jesus wants to make you right before the father. And he's the only one who can. No amount of good works, no amount of comparing yourself to others will justify you before a holy, righteous God. Jesus did that work on the cross on your behalf. And he extends the lavish gift of righteousness to you today. Will you take it? In the cross, God's righteousness is revealed and extended to us. Do you believe that? I'm going to release to the campuses. Love you guys. Thank you guys so much for sticking around and hanging out with us wherever you're at in your home, uh, wherever you're watching this on your computer or your device. We're grateful to, to share this series with you about the lavish generosity that we've received in God, the spiritual blessings that he's given us. And we just want to give you a couple of questions to kind of contemplate and maybe, maybe talk to your community about your spouse, your children, or people in your, your home group, your life group, your small group. Just expound on this idea with people you trust. Firstly, the question, have you received the righteousness of God? Have there, has there been a moment where you have repented of your sin, placed your faith in Jesus and been made right before God? And if yes, who needs to hear that story? Parents, your children need to hear the story of Jesus rescuing you from the pit we walked through in Romans 3, verses 9 to 18. They need to hear that story. But maybe there are others. Maybe there's friends or coworkers or, or maybe your spouse even just needs to be encouraged by the story of you receiving righteousness from God because of your faith in Jesus Christ. And then the second question I want to leave you with today is, where do you see evidence of God's righteousness in your life? If you've been a follower of Jesus, you've been made righteous positionally before God. And that righteous identity should lead to righteous living. Not perfectly lived out, but increasingly lived out. And so how, how are you seeing uh, the, righteous, the righteousness of God in your life. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you that you give us the gift of your righteousness. And I pray that you would um, just help us, God, to, uh, to rest in the fact that we are righteous. In Christ, we are righteous. And I pray, God, for um, those of us who, who right now don't believe that, I pray that your spirit would speak truth to our hearts. 
And I pray that you'd give us wisdom and clarity as we evaluate our lives, God, um, to see where is the righteous, righteous fruit, uh, righteous fruit in our life. Do we see it? And are we growing in righteous living as we have this righteous identity before you? I pray you'd give us wisdom. And I pray you'd just be in the conversations that people have around this subject of your righteousness that's been extended to us. May we sharpen each other like iron sharpens iron. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, I love you. Thank you again for hanging out. Have a good Sunday.